the with the let's begin with the discussion because those ones um i think are the ones that i have more doubt um we said that the kinetic energy immediately after collision was equal to the potential energy of the system at the end what were we assuming uh, my answer is that there was no heat produced because if the kinetic energy was equal to the potential energy uh, uh, you know, energy is, is conserved all the time, but they're, if they're equal, that means that there's no heat produced. That is true, but let me, yes, and, and that's a perfect answer, but I want to just make sure you got uh, some other parts real clear. Uh, uh -huh. Let me see if I can see my yeah. hands on the video. So yes. during the impact, when the ball uh -huh. comes in and hits it, there was heat there. Then when it swings upward, there was no heat in the friction of the of the bearings when it swings up. Uh -huh. So when you say no heat, you're right. But what they really mean is there was no heat in the pivot as it swings up because there was heat in the collision. Oh yeah, otherwise it wouldn't have us move the angle. Right, 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 right. right. So anyway, so I just wanted to make that clear. So you might want to just say there was no heat in the uh, or after the collision. It that? was no hit after the collision. All right. Yeah. Let me make that right. Um, there, that was there. There was no hit. So that was the answer that you were expecting, or not? Yes, that is the answer I'm expecting. Yeah. Okay. Um, in the second one, it says, on the other hand, the kinetic energy immediately after collision was not equal to the kinetic energy. Collision. So, how do we know this? Uh, we know this because there was heat produced. I exactly right. So that's why I was clarifying that there was heat in the collision part of it, but not after that. So that's the answer because the the uh, okay. So that's the answer, correct? Yeah, that's the answer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in the other is the momentum before and after the collision were equal why is this i think it's because the newton's law that they must be equal the momentum uh, before and after the the mass the mass conservation of energy correct uh yeah but let me let me put it in a little more concise uh they just really want you to say because of the principle of conservation of momentum that's all yeah Okay, yeah. just a moment because yeah, the so, principle so. of conservation, the because of the principle conservation uh, of moment of okay. momentum, mm -hmm. conservation of moment. Okay, momentum. Okay, so um, the next one, um, just a moment. The next one is the, the following. I don't have anything for that. <laughs> because uh, the, the only thing that comes to my mind is that uh, this one, the last one showed why the time of the flight equals the square root of two times um, height uh, divided by gravity. This one seems to me more like the Pythagorean theorems. Something like that. This, I don't know, but I don't yeah. have anything for it. Can you read that question again? I didn't quite so, hear it. So show why the time flight oh. equals the yeah. square root of two times ah. height mm -hmm. divided by the gravity. Okay. By, the, by deriving the equation, explain the assumptions that are made. Right. Oh, okay. So uh, the. Uh, the uh the equ equation you want to start with is distance equals one half a t squared uh -huh, one half a, a so distance equals one half a t a uh -huh. one half a t squared okay a okay a t a squared okay okay this might be a see if I can get my phone up and running here this one might be a good one to all right, I can I can wait. Uh, this one might be a good one to to show you. Here here's the uh, here's the map they want to see. Uh, 
And uh, they want you to start with that equation that we learned all oh, three or four chapters ago. Oh, so what you mean by deriving the equation is that we, you want us to write the equations. Yeah, so, so start with this. Distance okay. equals one half a t squared. So that's what I didn't understand the deriving thing. So I think yeah. that's what you wanted. To, okay, okay. Okay. Then the second step would be to say, uh, in place of D, because it's dropping down, we'll call it H for height. Uh -huh. And since it's dropping, the acceleration would be G. So that's kind of the, the second step. Okay. Then the third step is to multiply both sides by two. Mm -hmm. Then the next step is to divide both sides by G. Okay. And then the last step is oh, taking- Showing like the, the algebra, I see. I see. Yeah. So they just want you to go through the algebra. That's what they mean by derive. Oh, all right. So to a G E. Okay. Okay. Um. So now I will perhaps tell you my my answers for um for for the the, the other questions. So I I think I did the right thing because um. I follow your instructions, but not following instructions precisely because in one of the questions you said, in this one, don't do any calculation, just write the answer for this the before. But then if I do that, the calculation doesn't match because I think you mix the questions because the one that, there's, there's, there's four questions. The first one is equal to the second. Yeah, and right. then. The six, the number five is no, hold on. The number five is equal to the to the to the six. So, and I think you did it backwards. You said uh, I think it was number six. It was equal to the seven, and, and then when you do the calculations in the next one, it doesn't match anything. So I, oh. I said uh, okay. uh, it doesn't make sense. So I did it, but anyway, I will I will I will say my answer. So maybe um, if you have any any key answer or I don't know how it goes, but for the first one, I got uh, equal zero point one six five joules. Okay, that sounds about right. Yes. In the second, I got one uh, zero point one six five joules. Good. Good. For the third one. Uh, I got 1.038 millimeters uh, square divided by second square. So velocity of pendulum and ball after collision equals uh, BP, IBB sub P equals a square root of two, um, two gravity H. Uh -huh. So, the answer for that is 1.038. Yeah, and then uh, that would be meters per second, yeah. Yes, meters per second. Oh, yeah, good. Uh-huh. Good, good, yeah, that's good, that's good. The, the, the unit system is uh, meters per second, but meters are in a square, in second square two, or just meters per second? It's just meters per second, because remember, you're taking the square root, so you have to take the square root of your units, too. Oh. Should yes, you're right about that. I was confused about that too. Okay. Okay. The number four is momentum momentum of pendulum and ball after collision. Uh I got the 0 0.3171 deals. Hmm. Okay, good, good, good. Okay. Um the other this one, the units I'm, I'm a little bit confused, but I don't know, maybe uh, you will explain to me. So in the number five, I got 4.834 oh. joules per kilo below per kilograms. Okay, hang on here. So let's go back to the one that says the momentum after the collision. Okay. Um, you should have got, let's see, zero point, and then what'd you get? Like a three one seven one. Three one seven one? Correct. And then it was kilogram meters per second would be the units. 
So that will be oh kilometer. Oh, so in that one is just because I remember because the first one is just kilometers per second. Sorry. So yeah. since, since the number the, the the previous one is just meters per second, this one will be kilometers uh, per meters per second. Correct. Okay, I see. It's not joules. Uh huh. No joules. Yeah. Okay, I see. I see. This is no joules. So um. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so so the la the next one then will be um. There will be a uh, kilogram. So hold on a second. Uh, if we have kilograms and then we have uh, kilograms. Hmm. So number five uh, should be the same as number four because number number five says what's the momentum before the collision, right? Uh huh. And number four says what is it after the collision, right? Uh huh. And you're supposed to be recognizing that conservation of momentum is saying they're the same. So whatever you got in four, you just write the same number down in five. So whatever, okay, so that's what I got, yes, okay, so that's the same answer I got for number five, I got three, one, uh, zero, one point, the same one, correct, yes, I got the same one, yes, you're right about that. Okay, and good. The units, the units is the, the units is the ones that, uh, they are the same, correct, the same units too? Same units, yeah, same number, same units. All right, perfect. So for number six, huh, I got, um, uh, a a four point eight three four. Four point eight. Okay, good, good. But the units, the units in this case, that would be exactly um, what unit would that be then? If it the should be is... meters per second because you're asked for a speed. Okay. Okay, meters per second, meters per second, and that's all. Hmm. I don't know the units throw me out or throw me over. I was very confused in those. Um, so what about kinetic energy of ball before collision? And that one I got 0 0.7665. Okay, good. And then that'd be units of joules. That would be joules, correct? Those joules. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. I think I got that one. Um then we have the number, um, the number, um, the kinetic energy of system after collision. I got zero point one six five joules. Right, that should be the same as number two. Mm -hmm. Yes, correct. That's what you said. Yeah, that's that's what I. Anyway, uh, the last one I got um, amount of heat energy produced in collision energy change is zero point. Zero, zero point sixteen fifteen. Okay, zero point six zero one five. Okay, that seems right. Yeah, that yes. seems right. And then when I do the percentage, I got seventy eight point five percent. Ah, very good. Yeah, seventy eight percent. Yeah, good. Okay, I think. And then the last one, um, the time of flight of the ball, I got um, zero point four four six meters per second uh just seconds but yeah just, the second? good. just second it's a time okay why oh because they're square you're right so we yeah yeah you're right about that okay okay yeah don't forget to take the square root of time yeah yeah the units you gotta take the square root of the number and the units yeah okay so the next one uh the horizontal velocity of ball i got uh four point Eighty meters. Ah, good, good. Pretty close to the same that you got on. It should be almost the same as you got on number six. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, the percent that would be meters. Yeah, the meters, the units. Yeah, meters per second would be the unit. Okay, and then percent difference of of the two velocity velocity calculations. Uh, for that, I got equals 0.09%. Ah, good, good, yeah, smaller the better. 0 0.09, yes, that's what I got. And I think that, that's it for the, for the, um, I, that's all the answers. Um, I think I have to, to go through the units again because I mean, I, I didn't understand the units because I got them all wrong, so I see what, I, I need to check what's going on. I think uh, the, the square root is that you're right. I need to square the, the units too. <laughs>
this. So that will make it. Yeah, that's the whole lab. All right. Thank you so much. So um, see you next week then. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye now. All right, let me jump back over here to the chat room. Let's see how you guys are uh, doing. And uh, let me just kind of throw that out there. Uh, I know I took a list. We didn't get as far as we'd like to in the uh, first hour. So I'm going to jump back to uh, 21, number 17, 19, number 41, 21, 46. And then I'll, I'll start all these other new ones. Looks like another one from, oops, I messed up my pen. Uh, another one from uh, Hunter and another one from Danny and then Jake. Uh, oh, I, it's like Jake's uh, re-asking the same one. Uh, I haven't forgotten that one. But um, I should throw out there, uh, anybody from 121, this was kind of a uh, preference hour for you guys. I'll, uh, I know I kind of took the, the 102 there because uh, I kind of messed up sending out the invites this time. <laughs> But uh, yeah, if the, if the rest of you are from all 123, uh, then I'll go ahead and say, all right, let's do uh, chapter 21. Number 17 was the next on the, the list before we took our break. I... Excuse me, Professor? Sorry yeah. to interrupt. Before you hop into the examples, um, is it yeah. okay to ask a couple of administrative questions about the exam for physics 123? Yeah, sure, sure. I uh, uh, okay. I will say that I, I meant to send something out. I I I uh, got sidetracked um, uh, yesterday. In fact, I was telling. Uh, I think some of you guys were there when I was telling her that uh, my day was going fine, and I had two big things to send uh, and to deal with. Well, more than two, but the two that I got overlooked was one. I wanted to send you guys information about the exam, and I still will do that before today's over. And another one was the invite for today, and I uh, got a call out of the middle of nowhere that I was eligible for a vaccine. And I just had to drive far and wait long. And anyways, took the rest of my day out of that, but it was good. I got my first shot and I got a sore arm, but it uh, was good to get that. So I got uh, consider myself lucky. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, for sure. Uh, great. I just wanted to confirm that we're having the exam on March 2nd. Yeah, so the exam's coming up March 2nd, uh, same as before. Well, we'll start uh, at 8.30, and it's open book, and you have till 11. Okay, perfect. I just heard in your recorded lectures that the 2014 spring class was taking it after spring break, so I was wondering if maybe I misunderstood something about the timeline. Oh, uh, <laughs> Back in those days, we didn't start uh, spring semester till almost February. We started oh, early. Wow. Okay. Yeah, we had six weeks off for uh, Christmas. We should do that again. Uh, yeah, yeah, kind of, kind of like it. And uh, uh, there's the reason. And they a few years ago they switched that so that they could have two summer sessions. That was the reason. Mm -hmm. So okay. yeah. Anyways, they moved it up so that that cut uh christmas break down to what are we at three weeks now or did we have four weeks we might have four weeks i think it was four yeah okay excellent thank you i just wanted it, to make sure that i wasn't losing my mind and yeah. that you'll still you're still planning on sending out the review materials right yes i am yeah okay perfect no, no rush at all i just wanted to make sure thank you very much okay good good great yeah great great question great clarity okay uh, so let's see. Now I will then jump over here to the problem set. This goes back to chapter 21. Let me scroll up to number uh, 17. And it says this, it says a one mole sample of a diatomic ideal gas has a pressure P and a volume V. When the gas is warmed, its pressure is tripled and its volume is doubled. Now, a couple things that come to mind, I'm going to keep reading here, but I'm going to make myself a PV diagram. Oh, and I'm also going to write down 
chapter 21, number 17, starting at about 1253-ish, uh, okay? Um, and so if I do a PV uh, diagram, it looks like maybe if I put my initial here, so maybe I'll put a little initial volume and initial pressure. And it says when the gas is warmed, its pressure is tripled. So maybe that puts it up to here. So three times the initial pressure. Uh, let's see, it's too warm, triple, and its volume is doubled. And so its volume would be here, which would be two times the initial. All right, so I'll make a little point there. So we start here, I'll put a little I for initial and I'll put an F here for final. It says this warming process is, includes two steps. The first is a constant pressure. Grab some different uh, colors here. Uh, the first is a constant pressure and the second is a constant volume. So constant pressure would be a horizontal line, which will kind of make in green. And then it goes upward at a constant volume, which I'll kind of make in this purple color. I don't know if you can see the different colors and if it's all that important, but what I do want you to see and to catch is I'm, I'm kind of thinking about this and, I, and I'm making my free body diagram because I, I, I suspect that'll be needed, okay? So the warming line includes two steps. First, a constant pressure and then a constant. Determine the amount of energy transferred to the gas by Okay, so maybe if I label this as A and then B and then C, I might talk about the process from A to B, uh, and then I might talk about the process from B to C. And so A to B is constant pressure. So if we do a delta E, uh, maybe a Q, and maybe a W, uh, we could fill this in, but maybe I shouldn't fill in the whole chart because it just says the amount transferred to the gas by heat. So they're just after these two columns. And those are the easier two because we have this heat at constant volume as NCV delta T. And we also have the other one, which is heat at constant pressure, which is NCP delta T. So the constant pressure is the first one, A to, A to B. So let me put the Q and I'll just put underneath it from A to B would be the one mole, because they, they say we've got one mole of a gas. And then it would be the molar specific heat at constant pressure. Now, the key to this is to go back where it says diatomic. And maybe up here at the top, I'll put CV because you count the degrees of freedom. So if it's a diatomic, it can translate in three dimensions, rotate in two, that's five degrees of freedom. And then CP, is always one R more than that. So if we have five halves and we add one, that makes seven half R. Okay, so I'm gonna put here seven halves R. And then it's the change in temperature. Now, they didn't explicitly give that to me. What they did talk about in the problem though is pressure and volume. So it is a general rule to give an answer if they don't give you numbers in the symbols they gave you. So I don't think I can just put delta T in here. I've got to write it in terms of pressures and volume. So I'm going to use the ideal gas law. So I'm going to go PV equals to NRT. 
Now, again, from A to B, it's a constant pressure. What has changed is the volume. So if you think about changing the volume on the, I guess this would be the left-hand side of the equation, it would correspond to a temperature on the right. I suppose we could also write it like this. Uh, we could say pressure at A times volume at A equals NR and the temperature at A. And if underneath it, we write pressure at B, volume at B, and our temperature at B. And if we subtract the top one from the first one, and remember it's constant pressure, these two would be the same, they would be a P, and then you would get volume at B minus volume at A. The N and the R would be the same, and then you would get the temperature at B minus the temperature at A. And I guess what I'm, I'm getting at here is this, well, maybe, I'll, maybe, maybe so you can see it better, I'll just write delta T here. Maybe I should have left this as an N, but this NR delta T is this right here. And our delta T really is the pressure times the change in volume. So we could write this as the seven half by itself and the NR delta T is the pressure times the change in volume. And the pressure is the initial pressure and the change in volume would be two to, times the initial minus the initial. So that would be just one initial. And so that would be the heat from A to B. And if I put it in my chart, I guess I'd write seven halves, P initial, V initial. So again, that's how much heat would have to go in during the, the first step, the constant pressure there doubling of the volume. Okay. Now, same logic, but now I guess I would be using the other equation for constant volume. Um, again, how much heat, let me leave the N alone, but now I would have CV. So that would be five halves R delta. Now, again, if we kind of think about the, the same thing and I write, okay, pressure at B times volume at B would equal to NR times the temperature at B. And since it's the same gas, I would have to take the pressure at C times the volume at C would have to equal NR times the temperature at C. And again, if I subtract the top one from the bottom one, I would get an NR temperature at C minus temperature at B on the right-hand side. That's this NR delta T. And so I would have over here. Now, over here, the pressure at C would be three times the initial minus the pressure, oh, that's pressure at C minus the pressure at B, that would be the initial, each multiplied by the volume. Now this is a constant volume. So even though I said volume at B and volume at C, it's still two VI. And maybe if I can just squeeze it onto this page, then this three minus one is a two. And then that two times that two is a four. So we would have four PIV up. So I can put that up here. I would have the five halves and the NR delta T right here is four. P-I-V-I. And now that I simplify my math, 
that becomes 10 EI VI. So over here in this little chart, if you will, I'll put a 10 PI VI. And if I add them together, that's a 10. And then let's see, seven over two is three and a half. So that means 13 and a half PI VI would be the total heat added to this. And this is a good one to remind you guys that you got to be careful on all of these because of you, you know how you calculate the heat or the work depends on how it is warmed up. And so that it was very clear that they made it at constant pressure versus constant uh, volume. And let me just scan the answer. What did they get? They got 13 and a half PV. Good. Nice. Now we'll give that a second to sink in if you guys want. But uh, I think what makes this thermodynamics quite challenging is that you know how the gas behaves is different versus in your different processes like constant volume behaves different than constant uh, pressure and that differences can drive you crazy after a while <laughs> it seems like the the solving process once you understand what path uh the energy is taking is pretty similar though as long as yeah you know. yeah so uh, right so it uh, I, and i should follow that up that it, it it seems daunting at first but after you get in kind of a rhythm and you begin to realize okay the thinking is still the same i just have constant pressure instead of constant volume or i have constant temperature or i have uh no heat so i have adiabatic you know uh, with a con can i like run a concept by you real quick just to double check that I got it right yeah um when we're if we draw like granted we draw a perfect pv diagram for whatever we're making or like whatever process we're trying to emulate basically is there isn't the the air the net area under the curve is always going to be that work there right so yeah. if i so always if i just have a vertical line i'm going to have no work basically right so, const okay cool yeah i just want to double check that i'm pretty sure that was how it worked but yeah, yeah, and I would say, you know, and, and uh, they, the thing, of course, is that getting the area under the curve is only easy when you have straight lines. So things with constant pressure and constant volume, you can just kind of look at the PV diagram and see the rectangle and go, oh, yeah, no problem. But when they are adiabatic or uh, isothermic, with those curves, you, you, you know, you got to rely on your map and your integrals. You can't just do geometry because you don't have nice square sides. But, all right, well, good. If, if, if that's good, I will uh, move along. Uh, again, going from uh, the chart from last hour, uh, let me, Try uh, chapter uh, 19, number uh, 41. I'll put a time of 108 and then put here, okay, chapter uh, 19, number 41. Okay. And uh, jump back to my homework page and I'll have to with the scroll up. So here's chapter 19, uh, 41. Ah, so 41 has the uh, thermal expansion stuff. Uh, let's see, it says here, the uh, rectangular plate shown in this picture has an area of A sub I for initial. And so it, it's got this rectangular plate. Uh, it's got some width and some length. Um, and so its initial area uh, would be its 
width times its length or length times its width, okay? It says if the temperature is increased by delta T, okay, so this is starting at some initial temperature. And they show a nice little picture then that when it warms up, the width is going to get a little bigger and the length is going to get a little longer now that it's warmed up to a temperature of initial plus a delta T. So that means its length is now L plus delta L. And its width is now W plus delta W, okay? And it says show that the change in the area has increased by uh, this amount. So I guess I would, I would do something like this. I would say, okay, what's the, the area now that it's warmed up? And so it would be its new width times its new length. Now, working with thermal expansion, uh, maybe I'll put the equation here at the top, but we learned that the change in length is this coefficient alpha, we called that the linear expansion coefficient, times the original length times delta t. So if I use this equation for the width, then I would have the original width and then plus alpha W delta T. And if I do that same thinking for the length, the change in length would be then alpha L delta T. And now, of course, if you kind of study this, you'll see that each of these two terms have a W in it. We can pull that out. Each of these two terms has an L in it. So you can pull that out. Um, I'll just put the order a little different, the W and the L together. But then I can foil this binomial with the second binomial. And so one times one is a one. One times alpha delta T is just alpha delta T. Then here I would have alpha delta T times one. And then here I would have alpha squared delta T squared. And these are the same. So I'll write that as two alpha delta T's. And then if you call this first part, this WL, the original area, and you do the distributive property, you get the new area, A, is equal to the old area, the, the beginning area before you warmed it up, plus, and then this term becomes two alpha A initial delta T. And this last term actually becomes an alpha squared initial area delta T squared. So, when you step back and kind of read this math here for a moment, you're going to say, okay, the new area is the old area, and then this is the increase. So this is the delta A. So you're saying that the increase in the area is two alpha times the original area delta T plus alpha squared times original area delta T squared. And now you kind of need to take one more step. You kind of got to look at your alpha numbers. Uh, for example, uh, steel popped into my mind. Uh, steel is 11 times 10 to the minus six. That's about 10 to the minus five. 
Now that's small. All right. So if this number here is about 10 to the minus five, when we square it, we get 10 to the minus 10. So this term is five zeros smaller than that term. Five zero, that's 100,000 times smaller. So I'll tell you what, let's just not even count that. That's, that's just so small, it's just not even worth discussing. And then we have it, there it is. The increase in area is two times the linear coefficient of expansion times the original area times delta T. And that's what you're kind of asked to, to prove. So you can use the linear expansion twice because that's what two dimensions is. Two dimensions is just an expansion, uh, you know, it, it was one dimensional expansion uh, twice. So. so yeah, I think that's what in your lectures you were kind of explaining that pattern and then if it's volume, then you're going to get three times alpha. Yeah, you would get three here and then you'd get a bunch of other terms, but they all would have like alpha squared or alpha cubed and you would just throw those away and say, look, those are, those are so small. And is that alpha another thing? Oh, that's the thermal expansion. Uh, yeah. You're saying we might have to, okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's the thermal expansion coefficient. And then in this chapter, chapter uh, 19, there's a, there's a big table that, that lists a lot of them. Okay. Um, I have one more quick question about this. Uh, in one of your lectures, you were talking about if you have a, like a hole in the center, like let's say if this was like a frame. Mm, mm -hmm. to, Good point, yeah. To treat it as if there was material inside and I wasn't quite grasping what you were saying there. And uh, yeah, let me try to draw a picture and I'll make a square opening, if you will. So if you had material, uh, I'll just say steel, and you had a hole in it that's a square, or one looks more like a rectangle than a square, okay, so, uh, but this is the hole. It's you need to realize the hole is there because of how long and wide the material is on the outside. So when you heat it up, the length gets longer and the width gets longer. And that means the hole actually gets bigger, uh, not smaller as people want to do, because they want they want to they want to say that this width gets wider this way. And although that's true, the length of it also gets longer, and that's what makes the hole actually bigger. And is it increasing at the same rate? The area yeah, the and because the hole is actually defined by the material that is making it, you know, the hole, the expansion of the material itself is what's increasing the hole. So that's why you can think of it as the hole is filled up with a piece of metal and however much that metal would expand in its length, as well as how much it would expand in its width, even though there's not a piece of metal there, the metal's on the side. It's what's making the hole. And so the thermal expansion of the hole is the same as if there was metal actually there. So if we were given a problem where we get, we're given this frame and it's asking you, how um, much larger does that hole expand? Yeah. We could essentially treat it like the problem we just did. Yes, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, yeah. thank you. Yeah, yeah, and that's the, that's the key to dealing with uh, holes is that they, they, they expand exactly the same way as if it was filled up with metal.
Mm -hmm. Until you just think about it filled up with metal. Mm -hmm. Good, yeah, good question. Yeah, really good question. All right, next. Okay, so unless there's more on that question, I'll cross that one off my list. And oh, and I accidentally put that question in the chat again this time. I didn't. Oh, so you can just okay, one. okay, all right. I, I I will when I when we get back to the the, the new chats here. <laughs> all right, so let me try chapter uh, twenty one. Uh, number uh, 46, and I'll put a start time of 120 here. And so chapter 21, number 46 is some uh, leftover from the last, before we broke. Okay, and, oops, I didn't want to click on that. Okay, let me. Go back, we were already at the PDF. Okay, so 19, so let me go, there's 20, where's chapter 21, oh, there's 21, okay. So number 40, 46, here we go. All right, so let me read the problem here. It says, an air rifle shoots a lead bullet, bullet pellet, excuse me, pellet, uh, by allowing high pressure gas to expand, propelling, the pellet uh, down the rifle barrel. Because this process happened very quickly and no appreciable thermal conduction can occur, ah, and the, the expansion is essentially adiabatic. All right, so they're talking about an adiabatic expansion. In fact, maybe I'll, I'll pause and just kind of in my mind go, okay, so I've got an adiabatic expansion. So if I do a PV diagram, maybe I start here, which would be a uh, initial pressure. So high pressure, uh, small volume. Uh, later on, it's going to become, I'm gonna follow that kind of that curved part that we were saying is the, adiabatic process. So it's going to get to a higher volume and a lower pressure. Okay. Now, again, I don't know if I'm going to need a PV diagram, but I do know it would look like that on a PV diagram because it's adiabatic. And I also know this, that the pressure times the volume raised to a power of gamma would be some kind of constant uh, of course, that constant would depend on how many moles and what temperature it's at and all those good things. But this is the uh, mathematical connection between pressure and volume in an adiabatic process. So that's kind of what's going through my mind first. And I would you know, kind of say the same thing to you, that you read this problem, you read adiabatic, you're thinking, okay, this, the, the, these two things come to mind, this math and this, this diagram. Here. All right. Now, it says, suppose that the rifle starts with 12 cubic centimeters of compressed air. Okay, so right there, they just told me that number is 12 cubic centimeters. They're giving me the initial volume, uh, which behaves like an ideal gas of gamma. Ah, and they're telling me gamma is 1.4, which is the number we've seen many times but that's the number you get for a diatomic. So I don't know if you've had the fun of playing with the air rifles, you know, you know pump them up, you know, and uh, shoot them. But you're using the air and the air is, you know, 80% nitrogen or almost 80% nitrogen and almost 20% oxygen. So everything in there really is diatomic with the exception of very, very few pieces. So again, my default is always to use diatomic, they start talking about air and air compressors because it's just mostly nitrogen and oxygen, All right? But they, they've even helped us out. They, they're not gonna make us assume we're dealing with air, but they said air rifle. And to me, I was already thinking, okay, diatomic, but they, they, they helped me out by just saying, hey, it is 1.4. Okay, now it says here, the expanding air pushes a 1.1 gram bullet as 
a piston with a cross-sectional area of, all right, so maybe if I had a drawing, maybe I have a, a, a little chamber of compressed air and it releases it, pushing the little pellet down the rifle. Um, and so maybe the stock of the gun is here. Maybe the trigger. <laughs> Here, maybe the sights are here. I don't know, just trying to give a picture here. But somehow it's compressed in this little area of 12 cubic centimeters. And it's going to be pushing this along like a, like a piston would, or uh, how'd they say, the expanding air. Yeah, as a piston with a cross-sectional area of 0 0.030 square centimeters along the gun's barrel. So it goes pushing it. And so by the time it, it gets to the end out here, and the little pellet is being ejected, it's going pretty fast. There was amount of work done on it. Okay. And they say that it pushed it for a distance of 50 centimeters. Now, by the way, I don't know if you caught this in the picture, but isn't that also telling me the new volume? Because we had a volume of 12, and now as it moves down, the volume of this cylinder chamber that'd be the rifle part of the rifle uh, that that part right there the bore of it th th this is uh, a new volume that's what this gas expands into of course once the pellet leaves then the gas continues to expand but that doesn't push the the pellet anymore so I, I I'm not going to think about after the pellet is far away from the gun but just as the the pellet it's shooting is exiting the, the gun because it says that the pellet emerges with a velocity of 120 meters per second. And then it says, oh, use the result from problem number three. Ah, so uh, 43. In 43, we've got the equation for the uh, work done in an adiabatic expansion to find the initial pressure uh, required. Okay, so with all that in mind, uh, I'm going to look up at problem number 43 here and say, okay, so number 43 says that the work is one over gamma minus one, and it would be final pressure times final volume minus initial pressure, initial volume. Now, directly in the reading, it looks like they only gave me the initial volume, but I claim that they indirectly gave me the final volume because they've given me uh, the length of the barrel and the cross-sectional area. So I, in my mind, I'm going, okay, I know the initial volume and I know the final volume. Now, I would also say, I know the work. I think it's okay to assume atmospheric pressure. But see, this expanding gas did really two things. It pushed 
the uh, bullet, making it go faster. So it, it did some work by giving it kinetic energy. But don't forget also that in the process, it had to push the atmosphere back too. So it had to push on the atmosphere. So I think I can get this number too by saying how much work is done here. Um, think that will work. Because the other thing going through my mind was this original equation that if I took the initial pressure times the initial volume raised to a factor of gamma, that would then be equal to the final pressure times the final volume raised to a power of gamma. And so as I look at these two, I'm thinking I have two equations with two unknowns. I, I, I don't know the starting pressure and I don't know the final pressure, but I think I know everything else. I'm still kind of questioning the work here on this. I think that's what they what they want here. I, I have a question on that. Would we yeah. would we know the final pressure because at the end of the problem it says the pellet is outside of the barrel? Like so wouldn't the pressure normalize back to atmospheric or no? Um I, or is that not part of the problem? I, I might be overthinking it. No, 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 no. I I no, I, I like what you're thinking. And that's going through my mind too. And I I I'm looking for some wording that I don't see. Here, here's my problem with that. When, when the gas is expanding and it gets to the end, the pressure at the end doesn't have to be atmospheric pressure. In other words, it can push the bullet out the end and it could still be under a pressure that's higher so the gases continue to pour out because they're at a higher pressure than the atmospheric pressure. Okay, I see that. And, uh, and in fact, it's this push out that you would eventually push against your ears. This is what you would hear. So if the pressure came out to be exactly equal to atmospheric pressure, you wouldn't hear the pop of the gun. But if it's higher, then you hear a pop to it. And then of course, how much higher, the, the higher the pop. And so, you know, these pellet guns, you just kind of hear the pew, pew, you know, and if it's a 22, it's a little louder. If it's a 30 odd six, it's extremely loud. So the pressure exiting the, 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 the muzzle, it can be really, really high. So. I uh, was hoping I could kind of justify that the final pressure was the atmosphere, and that's what you were going with it. And I, I don't think I can. I, 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 I think we've got to do the two equations, two unknowns here. All right. So this is a pretty tough uh, problem here, but fortunately we didn't have to prove this equation. That was another uh, problem altogether. So uh, I'm gonna. I'm going to use that to my advantage. But as I look at this, two equations, two unknowns. Let me let me start with maybe the, finding this one. What is the final volume? So the final volume I claim would be the initial volume of the of the chamber uh, plus how much it expands, and it looks like the cross sectional area they say was 0 0.03 centimeters squared and the length is a half oh no not a half a centimeter it's 50 centimeters half a meter but I'll, i'm going to use centimeters for a moment anyways because they told me this initial volume is 12 cubic centimeters. 
So if I grab my calculator and go 0 0.03 and multiply it by 50, there's a 1.5 cubic centimeter increase. So this is 13.5 cubic centimeters. All right, well, let me call this page one. Okay, so if I grab the equation, initial pressure times initial volume raised to a power of gamma is equal to final pressure times final volume to a power of gamma. Maybe I'll write initial pressure divided by final pressure as final volume divided by initial volume raised to gamma. So we just did the final at 13.5 and the initial at 12 and the gas being diatomic is 1.4. Page two. So thirteen point five over twelve raised to a power of one point four means that this number here is about a one point one seven nine. Okay. Now, coming back to this other equation, uh, I was claiming here that we could get the work if we think about this expanding gas here, having to do two things with its push. It's, it's, it, it's pushing the bullet, so that's more of a mechanics amount of work. So that's where some of the work is going by pushing the uh, pellet. But the other part is it's pushing back the atmosphere. So we've got to apply a force to push back the, uh, the atmosphere. And that's the one I want to be a little careful with. I think they want us to just Keep it that simple. I don't think they want any shock waves or anything going on. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the work and I'll say work total and I'll put two pieces, one and two. Uh, like I said, the first one is the amount of work that I would put as a kinetic energy. I would just say, look, it's, it, it, it's making, the pellet uh, move. Yeah, and I think the other one, they just are gonna say, go ahead and push the gas back. Uh, maybe I'll write it first as force times distance, but the force that, you know, to push the, uh, on the air is the atmospheric pressure. So it would be pressure times area times the distance it moved. And that right there is that volume that we just calculated. Where did we do this volume right here? This 1.5 cubic centimeters. That's how much we push the, the atmosphere uh, back in order to get the, the pellet to, to go down there. So 1.5 cubic centimeters. And I'm not sure I really like cubic centimeters here. So let me put things so they'll come out to be joules. 
so here is one half. Uh, the mass of the pellets, uh, what was it? 1.1 grams. So in kilograms, 0011. So there is the mass in kilograms. Putting in a speed of 120 and squaring it. I'm kind of curious uh, what that number is. 0.5 times 0 0.0011 times 120 squared. So this is about 7.92 joules of work. Um, as far as the work to push the atmosphere back, uh, let me put the pressure as 101,300 pascals. And let me put the volume in cubic meters. And then fortunately, it's an easy conversion. Think of centimeter cubed as centa cubed. A centa is 10 to the minus two and you cube it, you get 10 to the minus six. So this would be 101,300 times 1.5 times 10 to the negative six. Ah, and this kind of what I was wondering may not really be that relevant. Most of the work here is pushing on that bullet. It's not really doing much work pushing the, the, the atmosphere back. But nonetheless, I got a little bit there. So I'll put them to, together. So that number plus the number up here, 7.92. And so we're looking at a work of about 807 joules. Okay, so now going back to page one where I, where I had this equation here, I'm gonna put in my work. So there's the 8.071 joules of work. Uh, this right here would be one over, and gamma minus one, if you'll let me just subtract one from that is a 0. 0.4, so I'll just put a, a 0. 0.4. And, and yes, I need to come back to the equation. Are we trying to find the initial pressure or final? Um, the initial. Yeah. To find the initial. Okay. So let me get rid of final. And so right here where it says final pressure. I'm gonna come back over to here and write it as initial divided by 1.179. <laughs> that would come over to here, that'd be final. So that would be that term right there, the, the final pressure. Uh, the final volume would be the 13.5 times 10 to the minus six cubic meters. That's what we got right there. Minus, uh, and we got the initial pressure. And that initial volume is the 12 times 10 to the minus six cubic meters. All right. so. Using everything in the, I'll call the appropriate units. We've got energy in uh, joules. Uh, we've got volume in cubic meters. So when this is all done, we will have pressure that will be in Pascals. In fact, maybe I'll just make one more line here. I'm gonna factor out the initial pressure and put that with and above the 0.4. 
So this right here is 13.5 times 10 to the minus six over 1.179 minus 12 times 10 to the minus six. Oh, by the way, I made a little sign error that just dawned on me. Um, when we calculated work, uh, this work was done on the bullet and on the atmosphere. So it should be a negative on our expanding gas. The energy is coming from the gas. So when I talk about the work uh, from this gas, I should have put a negative. It's, it's leaving the gas. Remember, negative signs is when the energy leaves the gas and positive is when it goes to the gas. Okay. So I think I would run into a sign problem if I, I bet that number right there is negative. Oh, or is it? 13.5 divided by 1.179, is that gonna? Yeah, okay, it's gonna be a little, yeah, just negative, okay. All right, so without that negative, it would have come out to be a negative pressure. It would have, would have been weird. Okay, so let me uh, come over here and do this 13.5 times 10 to the negative six and divide it by 1.179. Let me subtract off 12 times 10 to the negative six. Yeah, so there's that negative number. And as long as I'm still working on this side, let me divide that by 0.4, okay? So then if I take this negative 8.07 and divide it by my last answer, we are looking at an initial pressure of 456, it looks like, Five million eight hundred and seventy three. There'll be enough significant figures. Thousand Pascals. That's about 58 atmospheres. That seems pretty high. Let's look this one up. Uh, 21, number 46. You got what they got. Uh, okay. Yeah, they got 58 atmospheres also. Okay. Just seems high. Maybe that's why the valves keep breaking on my air rifle. It was a, it was a shh. Seems like every few years I'm like, what? It's leaking again. Maybe I should take care of it better, but maybe it's just high pressure. <laughs> oh, good. That, oh, that, that was a bit of a challenging one. That, 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 that was a challenge. All right, good question on that one. I have a, a conceptual question. Uh-huh, fire. So I'm curious. Um, why doesn't like kinetic energy contribute to entropy at all? Like when you have those molecules moving, don't they collide into like air molecules, which shakes those molecules up and would create their motion to be more erratic? And or... uh, yeah, yeah. So I keep keep talking because I'm still not understanding your problem. If you, my understanding of entropy was kind of the randomness of the molecular molecular motion kind of how so right, when, right. You, when you heat them up it causes them to bounce around more so then their right. motion is more random so why doesn't when you are colliding into them doesn't that create more motion that is causing entropy and, and more random direction or no it, it it is it is so i guess i'm i'm still kind of wondering uh 
what you're, you know, what you're, what you're driving at. Um, because I was, I, curious, I was just trying to, uh, it was just making me think about. It, so your, your, your conceptual question is right. It, there's a randomness to it. Okay. So for example, the problem we just did with the pellet, the, the air gun, the kinetic energy of the pellet has no entropy. That is not random motion. That is all the molecules going in a straight line. So that we don't do, but, um, oh, and maybe, let me come back to the, the uh, air rifle. Uh, okay. Or maybe I'll just mention it again. I just did the air rifle problem. No, I can't find the, the paperwork on it. Is it, but do those but, air molecules coming out of the barrel collide with air molecules in the atmosphere and cause entropy in the atmosphere? And increase ah, okay, okay, okay. Well, I wondered if you were saying that. Let, let me let me do this for a moment. Let me let me say that I have a container. Okay, so here's my container, and as you said. They are moving around and let's say they're under a high pressure. And, and so then I have this little opening. Okay, and then I open the valve. Well, maybe there's a little ball valve here or something. And so I open it and they go rushing out. And as you say, that rushing out is going to hit the air molecules and make them move randomly. So yes, that is an increase of entropy. However, keep in mind that they themselves though are cooling down because when they hit, they slow down. So that's a decrease in entropy. So the net is no entropy? Right, right. And so right. In, in, in an adiabatic expansion, there is no change of, of entropy. And like, so when you're, talking about an object in motion, you, would you just kind of consider entropy to be included in the resistance if it was like just air resistance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, the, uh, the uh, equation for entropy, which we did a couple of them on the, on the previous uh, Zoom, but not, not this Zoom. We said, yeah, we said that this is, the equation, this is an infinitesimal small amount of entropy change. Notice it depends upon heat. So you have to have heat. If, okay. you, if there's not heat energy, there's no entropy. Okay, and then that heat would come from the friction of air molecules. Right, right. So if you just uh, go back to physics 121, we never talked about entropy in 121 yeah. because everything was mechanical energy. We seldom even dealt with heat. And so if your car is going uh, 60 miles an hour and slows down to 30 miles an hour, now here's brings up the question, how did it slow down? Because normally cars slow down by making friction and that makes entropy. But let's say the car slowed down because it bumped into another car. Um, Looking for an example without heat, maybe uh, I say the, bumped into the car, but maybe there were like magnets. So they never actually touched. One car slowed down, the other one sped up. Uh, anyways, there's no entropy discussion there. There, there is no uh, change in entropy. There is no, you know, you can't have entropy without heat, I guess is really what it boils down to. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I was just trying to, because I was thinking about, I wonder why, we have we never did it in previous semesters because right right so entropy is yes a quantity that I th I think of all the quantities we learn these first uh, three semesters in physics entropy is probably the toughest because it's it's something you're not exposed to it's limited to only heat it's nothing mechanical about it um, it's a statistical randomness number um, it's just it's really, really hard. 
Whereas velocity, I think it's easy for people to picture velocity. You know, you can sit there on the side of the road and you can watch things go fast or watch them go slow. <laughs> and you go, okay, I get the idea of a big speed versus a little speed. I can see it with my eyes. Yeah. Okay. Kinetic energy, actually, I think potential energy is even a little hard because you can't see it with your eyes. You're just like, okay, well, this object here has more mass, so it has more potential energy. Or this object is higher up, so it has more energy. Uh, so it's a little harder, but entropy is the hardest, yeah. no doubt. Okay, well, I think that, that cleared up my, curi my yeah. curiosity, so thank you. Yeah. And uh, this is the other thing about this class that for better or worse, um, it's like four mini classes. So we have now just got to some pretty significant thermodynamic stuff. I mean, we can talk about, you know, uh, like the auto cycle or the diesel cycle or the Stirling cycle or the Carnot cycle. Those are the three big or four big cycles that we talk about, especially the auto cycle, since that's the design of the internal combustion engine that we're so used to, and well, even in the diesel cycle. Um, all of those are great discussions of thermodynamics um, and they involve entropy. Uh, we finally got to that point and now we're gonna leave. Now we're off the off. So right. good and bad. Uh, the good is we've really got to some hard stuff and we're gonna leave it. <laughs> the bad is you've got to some really good practical stuff and we're gonna leave. Yeah. I was I was looking at some of the engine stuff and it was like describing how the fuel is expanding in the piston. I really yeah. like that. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So. All right. I'll let you get back to uh, someone's question. Thank you. All right. So with that in mind, let's yeah jump to that finishes up our three from uh, the previous list. Let's me jump over to who was the first here all right hunter we have a 21 number 46 oh wait did we just do that one yeah okay so that was the one we just did so you were just throwing that one back up there yeah i forgot you had them written down yeah good and then danny oh yeah you did the uh, 21 number 17 and we did that yeah one. i did the same thing as hunter Ah, uh, yeah. And then Jake, uh, we did the uh, 19, number 41. All right. And then Ryland, have you guys done number 59? Uh, certainly not today. So we'll do that one. How about that? So 22. Uh, number 59. And it, it doesn't sound familiar. I don't think I did a video solution for it. And we will put one. Yeah, there three. wasn't one. I just wanted to make sure we get as many video solutions out there as possible today. So not to repeat, I can go watch them if you guys already did them. <laughs> yeah, th yeah. Thank you. That 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 is yeah best that we kind of hit some new ones. Um, and, and I think this is a new one, unless I did a video solution last week because I don't remember. We did, certainly didn't do it today. I looked for it before I. But so I, the only thing would have been if it had been done this morning. Okay. All right. So let's give it a try here. 15. Oh, and it's, oh yeah. That's, I bet it's a hard one because it's way up there in the big numbers, huh? It's magenta. Oh, that's why I like to look at the uh, black and white PDF. <laughs> like I can't, I can't tell. All right, so I'm looking at it now, and it's black and white. Oh, yeah, but it's a diesel cycle. So oh, this is a good practical one, too. Here, Yeah. All right, so uh, this was kind of diesel's thinking when they, they decided to make a new cycle. And uh, said, you know, hey, let's, let's do something a little different that's more efficient. Um, but uh, let's see. So chapter 22, uh, number uh, 59. Uh, it's kind of this idealized uh, diesel engine operates in the cycle as shown. Uh, the air standard diesel cycle is shown. Fuel is, oh yeah. And this is the one that I 
somebody asked last night that I, I didn't have the whole problem there. So I sent that last night too. So keep that in mind as you uh, work this one. Uh, but let me then jump to the uh, textbook. And uh, yeah, definitely magenta. All right, because the rest of the problem is on the other side. All right, so let me draw the, the PV diagram. Oh, let me turn my share back on. All right, come on, connect. There we go. Okay, so number uh, 59 here. Here is the thinking of diesel that if the, the piston uh, is down at the, the bottom, what we call bottom dead center here, and let's see, he labels this volume one or volume at A. And he calls this point A. And he says, as the piston compresses the gas, it gets to point B on our P, V diagram. And that's our adiabatic compression. And then it roughly, and I'm glad he says idealized, because this isn't quite perfect in the real world, but here's his thinking that you then eject fuel into the cylinder and the fuel is at a set pressure. So as the fuel enters the combustion chamber and starts to burn, if the pressure goes up, uh, then that limits the fuel from coming in. And so fuel only comes in when the pressure drops a little bit, which burns more. And so the pressure roughly stays constant, and so this is the constant pressure from V to C, this is the burning of the fuel. And in this diagram, they call this Q hot. They say this is where the energy comes in. This is the burning of the fuel. So is this, is this saying that when you when you burn the fuel, the piston is is going down at the same rate that the gas is expanding. No, then actually it's over idealized. This is saying the fuel goes in so quickly that if you can just imagine momentarily the piston. Um, no, no, I'm sorry. I, I you you said that right. I I heard it wrong. Yes, no, okay. yes, yes. So this is saying yes that as the piston goes goes down which is the expansion volume from A to C. And so as the volume is getting bigger in there, the fuel is constantly being ejected inward that it keeps the pressure the same as it burns. Mm. And if it goes in too much, then the pressure gets so high that it doesn't let fuel in. So. The, the pressure doesn't drop as the piston's going down. However, the pressure doesn't also go up because it burns it because the fuel is uh, blocked from going in if the pressure is too high. So that's the whole idea of a diesel engine. It's a, it's a, it's a direct uh, injection of fuel into the burning chamber, to the combustion chamber. Okay, now, once the 
fuel is cut off, if you will. And so the, the fuel's only injected for a little bit as the piston goes down. So from what they would call volume B to volume C, uh, once that is shut off, then there is an adiabatic expansion because you've got these hot gases in there. And so it continues to expand and continues to push the piston downward. Uh, so the volume continues to expand till they get to part uh, or point D here. And so this is another adiabatic. So C to D is, is adiabatic once the fuel cuts off. And when you get to D here, uh, D is the place where roughly the piston has reached the bottom of the cycle. So it's the top uh, or bottom dead center here. At that point, the uh, exhaust valve opens. And again, a little over idealized, but if you let the valve open right there at that moment, the pressure is going to drop like a rock until it gets to, well, roughly atmospheric pressure. That's probably not a fair statement either, but you know, all this is going out to the air. And so it's just gonna, you open that valve and it just goes rushing outside. Uh, it is blocked a little bit by all the pipes and the catalytic converter, uh, the muffler. So the exhaust pressure is not quite atmospheric pressure, but for an idealized world, it is. So, so that's, our, that, that's our cycle, all right? So this is where I would say the heat energy of cold comes out. And if you've ever accidentally got your hand or foot near a tailpipe, I'm not sure you would call that cold air, but that is cold compared to what it was when you, right after it was burnt and before it gave up some of its energy doing work, pushing the piston. So the exhaust gases is where the heat is coming out. That's the cold, quote, quote, cold part of the, of the gases, okay? All right, now uh, I gotta go to the top of the page here to see what it says. Sprayed into the cylinder at the point of maximum compression B, uh, combustion occurs during the expansion from B to C. That was uh, one of your guys' question, good question. Uh, which is modeled as an isobaric process, uh, show that the efficiency of this engine operating can, of this idealized diesel cycle is given by, and they got this equation, okay? So why don't I look at the A to B, the B to C, the C to D, and then the D back to A again. And I'm gonna make a little chart here that says, okay, what is the change in internal energy? What is the heat energy? And what is the work? Now they're just after the efficiency. So I don't think I need to fill in every part of this chart. And I'm gonna start with what I think are the, the easy ones. Remember the easy ones are the ones that have zeros in them. So A to B is adiabatic. And the adiabatic is zero heat. So A to D, I'm going to put a zero right there. And by an extension of that, I'll go C to D. That's the adiabatic uh, expansion. So 
A to B is the adiabatic compression. C to D is the adiabatic e e expansion. Now, the B to C is isobaric. And sadly, none of those are zero, so I won't touch any of those. But the D to an A is isovolumetric. And so there's a zero for the work. However, since we are after, ah, oh good, it just kind of hit me. I was just kind of figuring out what direction to go. But since we're after efficiencies, we can look at the heat energy or the work energy or some combination of both of them. But I think it's gonna be easier to look at just heat energy. Here's why I say that. The definition of efficiency, E, is the amount of work you get out of your engine compared to the amount of heat energy that goes in. And so if you come back to my PV diagram, we said that heat energy would go in from B to C. So right here, this is the heat energy. This is the, the one that's going in. And that's an isobaric process. And those are pretty easy to calculate. And the heat that comes out from D to A is an isovolumetric, and that heat is easy to calculate. So, <coughs> excuse me, I think I'm going to focus on the heat. So let me do this. Let me take the definition of efficiency together with conservation of energy. Remember, conservation of energy says this, that the heat's coming in must equal to the heat energy coming out and the work coming out. This is our conservation of energy. Now, we probably need an absolute value sign there because we have traditionally been labeling energy coming out as a negative. And the way I just said it, I would be treating it as a positive. So these two come out. So the absolute value of these two, oh, that's, out, that's already positive, but well, Maybe I should put absolute value there just to make sure. And I'll do all of them. <laughs> so thinking of them in terms of absolute value, the heat going in is equal to the energy coming out, which is the cold energy and the work. Uh, because that's how my efficiency is defined. You see, I can solve this for work. This would be Q hot minus Q cold. And I guess technically we're looking at absolute values. Although I suppose the QH is already a positive. So making it an absolute value is kind of pointless, but the Q cold is a negative number. So I do need to be a little careful there. Ah. So what this looks like as one minus the absolute value of Q cold over Q hot. And I think I'm still quite a bit away from an answer. Oh, no, I'm not. I see it coming. Okay. But I will say that it's beginning to look a little bit like what they want me to get it to look like. They want me to say the efficiency is one minus something. All right, and I am kind of there. I'm at one minus something. Now they have temperatures in there, but remember that the B to C, which is the QH, would be the uh, N uh, CP delta T. And then again, notice I use CP, right? This is the constant pressure. And then the D to A is constant volume. So this would be N C V delta T. 
All right, so let, let me put that into my little formula here. So this is one minus, and uh, the cold one is the D to the A. So this would be N C V delta T. Uh, now let me be careful and do an absolute value sign. Remember we said this, we really want absolute value here. And then the hot temperature one, this is where it goes in. This is where the fuel was burning. This is the B to C. This would be the NCP delta T. Now, maybe the way I wrote it looks like my delta T's are the same, but this, this is not. The, the uh, cold one, uh, this is the D to the A, and the hot one is from the B to the C. So these are different temperatures. All right, so I'm gonna have to go to a, another page here. But what I have so far, is the efficiency of the diesel cycle is one minus, and I got a CV over a CP. Uh, now in the top, I have the absolute value of D to A. Now I suppose I would write that as temperature at A minus temperature at D absolute value. And then down below, I would have the temperature at C minus the temperature at B. And of course, absolute value means that you should take whichever one is the biggest first. And coming back to the PV diagram, right? The gas expands to here at A, and then it then it is you know dropping its pressure, so its temperature goes goes down and that's they means that a is at a lower temperature than d uh, so with that in mind i could write this as temperature at d minus temperature at a without the absolute values now that i know which one's bigger and then downstairs i never had to worry about the absolute value i already knew from the beginning that c would be bigger than than D. Now, the last step is to say that you could take this and move it underneath. So you get one over, and then this would be CP over CV, temperature at D minus temperature at A over temperature at C minus temperature at B. And that right there, CP over CV is the the definition of gamma. So this would be one minus one over gamma, temperature at D minus temperature at A over temperature at C minus temperature at B. And we got there. And again, I guess that deserves a magenta. I'm not real sure. It was only a page and a half. <laughs> But it maybe the hard part really is right here at the beginning, focusing on, okay, I'm gonna do efficiencies. Do I focus on work or do I focus on heat? And given the cycle had constant pressures and constant volumes and adiabatic, it was just kind of a natural uh, go-to in my mind to go to the, talk about the heat energies, not the work energies, because adiabatic heats are easy and isovolumetric and iso Baric are also easy. So that was kind of my, my go-to. I think that was actually easier than in the lecture I did the auto cycle. So, All right. Well, unless you guys have a question. Oh, we might be past break time, aren't we? Yeah. Two o'clock. Oh. oh, yeah. I guess I talked way too long. <laughs> All right. Well, it's uh, 219, although let me go back over to the chat because uh, I think you guys had some other good uh, 
uh, questions here. I want to write those down so we can do that in the next chat. Let's see, that was what was not number 59. Um, I have a, another entropy question. Oh, OK. Um, so for a question like this, are we just kind of not focusing on entropy, but we know that it comes into play when we're calculating the efficiency? Is that why we don't? Oh, yeah, good point. Yeah, yeah. There, there was no need really to uh, even do an entropy thought into this. Um, um, and that, that's just factors into the efficiency. Yeah, I, I guess what I should say is we, we, I didn't do entropy. The second law of thermodynamics says the entropy must increase for everything. Um, and what we have focused on is just the engine. Notice that some heat energy is going into the atmosphere. And so there is this entropy coming in because of the burning fuel. There's this entropy that's exiting. And, and so it would be a fun and long discussion about the entropy that's going on here. Okay. But the entropy for the engine itself um, is zero. Remember, if you go through a whole cycle, if you get back where you started, like let me put it in the chart here. If I put total down here at the bottom, delta E is a state function. So remember, if you ever have a cycle that goes all the way through and gets back where it started, that means when you get back to the, where you started, the molecules are moving with their same temperature. They have their same concentration. Everything about them is the same. So they end up getting back to the same energy state. And they also get back to the same randomness. Okay. So if you're only interested in the entropy of the engine, there's really nothing of interest here because of the change of entropy of that cycle is zero. What if you were to focus on how the, the entropy affects the efficiency, is it because during that explosion, not all the gas mo uh, molecules are going up into pushing that piston or pushing down the piston? I guess I would say it this way, uh, back to this chart. So the, the total of the four cycles has to be zero. And A to B was adiabatic. And C to D was also adiabatic. So what, what is really dictating my efficiency is right here that when the heat flows in at from B to C, so from B to C, let me just give a number. Let's say it's a plus 100 flowing in as entropy. I have to get 100 flowing out during the D to A cycle. And to get that much entropy to flow out means I have to have this much um, heat energy flowing out. That's the limits in terms of entropy, but that's all built into this set of equations here. So I never really needed to give it much thought here. The fact that I did it here would actually show that it works here. I guess what I'm trying to, I'm trying to like, get a physical picture of what entropy is doing if it <laughs> seems like it's kind of a conceptual idea but so is it i guess when you say it's flowing in okay is does that have to do with the the ram, randomness of the molecules during the combustion state or does it have to do with the how the the incoming heat affects um mm -hmm. Yeah, I, don't, I was just trying to okay. picture. Yeah, here's what, here's what makes it hard. Uh, remember that a small change of entropy is related to a small heat divided by its temperature, okay? And 
back in this diesel cycle, a certain amount of energy going in at a high temperature. So why don't I say one joule at 600 is actually the same as a half a joule at 300. So in our heat engine, if we put in one joule at a high temperature, we can actually take out the same amount of entropy. That's the second law of thermodynamics. You have to take out the same amount of entropy. To close this cycle, whatever entropy comes in has to leave so you can start all over again. And what's kind of neat about entropy is then at a lower temperature, I can withdraw a smaller amount of energy and yet still let it represent the same amount of entropy. And we'll, we'll talk about randomness if you want, but I want you to focus on the energy for a second. So if that means if I put one in here at a high temperature to get the entropy to come out, I don't have to take out a full joule. I could do it at a half a joule. That leaves a half a joule left over to do work. That, that, that's what makes this process possible. You don't have to take out the same amount of energy that you put in if the energy you are taking out is at a lower temperature because entropy is not just energy, but it's energy divided by its temperature. Okay. And so maybe a better way of saying is it's not its randomness, but it is its energy concentrated for that temperature. So it has no real physical effect. It's just a more of a conceptual idea that. Yeah, well, yeah. And so it's, it is a, I don't want to say it doesn't have a physical effect because it, it, it is, and it truly is a, 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 a randomness. Um, but it's a, the randomness is related to also its temperature. And so um, the same amount of energy at a high temperature does not have the same randomness, I guess, as the same energy at a low temperature. Um, see if this analogy makes any sense. If you had, two cars, and they each increased in value by a hundred dollars. One way of looking at this is to say, oh, they went up by the same value. But another way is looking at their percentage. And if one car had an increase of a hundred dollars, but the car was already worth $10,000, that's only a 1% increase. If the other car went up in value a hundred and it was only worth a thousand dollars, that's a 10% increase. And that's really what entropy kind of is describing here. It's a, a percentage, it's the energy per that given temperature. So at very, 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 very high temperatures, the same amount of energy just isn't worth much entropy. So $100 out of 10,000 is not much 
in terms of percentage compared to the same hundred dollars at a thousand. Or maybe if this analogy helps, let's say you make one penny and each day you make a penny more. So the next day you make two pennies, you doubled your money. That's a hundred percent increase. But the next day you only make three pennies. Well, that's only a 50% increase. And then the next day you make four pennies. Well, that's, that's only a 33% increase. And the next day you make a same increase of a penny, but that's only a 25% increase. So a penny is not worth the same percentage even though it's still a penny. And, and that's what entropy is. Entropy is a randomness, but if you're already at a high temperature, if you already have a lot of randomness, a little more energy doesn't add much randomness to it. It's already very random. So one penny given to a millionaire is not a big deal. One penny given to somebody who only has a penny doubles their money. And so adding energy to something that's already at a high, high temperature, you're saying, oh, I'm adding randomness to it. Yeah, but it's such a small amount of randomness compared to what it already has. So, so then uh, and heat engines that work at higher temperatures will have less entropy or less more efficiency because less energy is lost due to entropy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, yeah. So coming back to our diagram here, to, to get the, the best efficiency, you really want this very, very high because it's essentially at a high temperature when it goes in means you are not, <clears throat> excuse me, adding much entropy. Then you want your cold temperature to be as low as possible because then you're saying that to get that same entropy out doesn't require much energy because we're at such a low temperature. And the difference in the energy between the hot and the cold is what's left over so you can do work. Mm -hmm. So yes, your, your most efficient engines are to make them high here and low here. Does the difference between the heat of the energy that you're adding, like, so does the QH, does the difference between that and the system that you're adding it to matter? Like the, the Q of the gas already before you? Um, To, to, to some degree, because the total energy going in is what temperature did the gas start with before you burned it, you know, but that usually shows up with the same on this end. So like the auto cycle, if you go through the efficiency of the idle auto, the auto cycle, uh, we never came up with anything in that equation that says what's the temperature of the starting gas. It just fell out of the equation because it, it kind of shows up on this end, but it also shows up on that end. And it's just really the increase of the burning of the gasoline. That's why if you want to have an engine more efficiently, uh, you switch to other fuels. Um, gasoline only burns so hot. So you got to switch to other fuels to do that. Of course, now you have other troubles. Your, your metals all, can only stand so much heat. So what is limiting the, a big limitation of the efficiencies of our engines is we just, we understand the entropy, but we, we are kind of limited by this high temperature. If we get them any hotter, the materials that they're made out of melt. So it becomes a material science problem. So for the sake of our problems, will we typically only be dealing with entropy directly when it's asking for a change in entropy? Uh, yeah, yeah. I guess to answer your, your, your other part of this question was that, yeah, any, if I just do what, what I did, which talks about the energies, I never really even focused on 
entropy, um, but yet the entropy was buried in all of these equations. And so that's why I never did come out to be, you know, 100% efficiency. I didn't have to, I didn't have to calculate entropies. Yeah, good point. It's not like I had to do the energy calculation and then limit it by some calculation based on entropy. All these, all these calculations are, are valid within themselves, including the effect of the entropy on them. All right, thank you. Sorry to hold you so long. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, 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 that's good. I'm gonna kind of, uh, uh, um, which I, I wish I explained it better, but I can give that some deeper thought, which is a good way. It, it, it's just tough. It's real, it is tough to picture entropy. Of all of our quantities, it's the, 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 the tougher one. And you got to think of it as a, more of a concentration. Yeah, I think I definitely have a uh, good enough understanding. Oh, in fact, I should, I should have said that. Another way of looking at entropy is not randomness, but also energy concentration. So how concentrated is your energy? So that's kind of what we're doing here. We're, we're taking the energy in a small little cylinder and it's he heavily concentrated and we expand it out, if you will. It expands to the atmosphere and it also gives some of its energy to the car itself to make it go. And so it goes from a high concentration to a low concentration. So the concentration uh, effect sometimes can, can help you visualize entropy a little better. All yeah. right, well, I, I will uh, take a little break. We'll come back in 24 minutes here. Uh, give me a chance to stretch my leg and go to the bathroom here. Let's see, uh, I do want to check here. Looks like uh, we've got a, a 54 and a number 39 in the chat room here. So maybe we'll come back and do those. Oh, and a 49. Did we do 49? Oh no, we did 46. So those three I see in the chat room. So we come back, I'll ask you guys which ones you want me to do first and which ones, uh... yeah, all right. I'll see you three. How's that? Oh, thank you very much. All right.